Well, good evening, and we're delighted to have you here. Uh, I feel a little odd saying good evening, and we're delighted to have you here. Not that we aren't delighted to have you here, but I don't think there is one person in this room, what, there is one person, one person in this room who hasn't been here before. Uh, this has become somewhat of a community event, and the fact that we're here, we're here this evening bringing together the Korean community and the Jewish community speaks a good deal about the efforts of what we do here at Queensborough Community College in the Kupferberg Holocaust Center. On our campus here, we have approximately 16,000 students representing almost 150 different nationalities that get along enormously well, enormously well. We have a sharing of cultures here on an ongoing basis. And what I'd like to do now is introduce part of the cultural program today. I'd like to come forward the Korean Traditional Music Association Institute of America, Cook Akwan Limited. Please, come on.
Thank you, thank you so much. <clears throat> At Queensborough Community College, an event like this just doesn't happen. We just don't make a few telephone calls and send out some notices. We're able to do this because of the support we get from the top of our organization. And when this idea of having this program uh, first was brought to my attention, the first thing I did was go to our president and introduce the topic. And um, I thought I was going to have to sit down and present a brief and argue it, but about three minutes into the presentation, she says, okay, let's go with it. The reason is our president understands the idea of communities coming together and supports that. And I'd like to introduce the president of the college, Dr. Diane Cole. Thank you, Dr. Flug. I echo welcome to Queensboro. Welcome back to Queensboro for many of you. It is very important to have an event such as this in a place where the consequences of not seeing people as people, as individuals, where that can lead. Grace Meng, our Congresswoman, is hailed as you know, a female leader, an Asian leader. She is our leader, she's a community leader. And it was her interest in this and support which brought us all together this evening. Queensboro is in the most diverse borough place in the United States and our student body reflects that. I appreciate the Congresswoman's leadership in bringing together the communities because that's what we are, a large community of different groups, but we share so many things. And I want to thank again our Congresswoman, Grace Meng, who has brought us to this point and will be here to lead this particular discussion tonight. So thank you, Congresswoman. Thank you so much, Diane. Um, I also want to echo Dr. Flug's uh, comments about how wonderfully easy it is to do a program like this at Queensboro Community College uh, with the leadership, under the leadership of our president, Dr. Diane Call. Uh, you know, I'll be honest, growing up as a kid in Queens, uh, I often thought that Queensboro Community College really led the way in teaching our diverse communities here in Queens and throughout New York City on how to build bridges. And so I'm very thankful and we're just doing what you've always taught us to do, what Dr. Flug makes look so easy. Uh, he has brought me, and I'm sure many people in this room, to countless meetings uh, to introduce different communities to each other so that we could learn from each other and to work together and collaborate to make our community a better place, our country a better place, and the world a better place to live. So I want to give a special acknowledgement to my staff and all of our wonderful panelists and the organizations uh, that made this event possible. They, they did all the hard work. Uh, I do also want to acknowledge my a very good friend and colleague, Councilman Mark Weprin. And I know, I believe, also Barbara Baruch from Assemblyman Ron Kim's office. And I think also Senator Toby Ann Stavisky, who is with Assemblyman Kim in Albany, uh, literally working and voting on a very important budget, uh, especially for our students uh, right now. Um, I also want to acknowledge the Korean American Association of Greater New York, President Min, who couldn't be here today, but thank them. J.D. Kim is here, very ably representing Cagney. And also the Korean American Association of Queens, President Yu. Uh, Mr. Consul General, if you would just indulge me a few seconds before we hear wonderful words from you. Uh, I just want to thank everyone once again for taking the time out of your busy schedules to be here with all of us tonight to have, to start, initiate, and to continue uh, this very important dialogue. I am so blessed and privileged to represent what I believe, don't tell my colleagues, the best congressional district in all of the country. <laughs> Thank you.
this is a district that covers areas from Bayside to Fresh Meadows to Flushings to, to uh, Ridgewood to Glendale to Forest Hills, Kew Gardens, Kew Garden Hills, and I always forget one or two and they're going to get mad at me. Uh, but uh, it's, it's one of the most diverse districts in the entire country and I'm so blessed every day to work with and to every day meet more and more people from different communities. Uh, we thought of doing this event, bringing together leaders uh, from the Korean American and the Jewish community, because I think it's important for us going forward to be able to work together, whether we're talking about foreign issues or whether we're talking about local issues that are important to our families. And there are a lot of commonalities. Uh, I mean, just South Korea and Israel know a little bit what it's like to live and work in a bad neighborhood. Locally, our families coexist. We work together, we go to school together, uh, we live near each other, and we have so much in common, whether it's family values, educational values. And so it's so exciting for us to be here uh, together today, and I hope that we can uh, start and continue this conversation. Tonight is just a one-time event, but I really hope that it's an opportunity for us to meet more people and to collaborate and to really, literally work together to make our country and the world a, a better place to live for all of our children. So thank you so much again to our wonderful speakers, uh, to Consul General Son. It's always an honor to see you and, and to work with you. Um, and to, of course, JCRC, who took me on my very first trip to Israel, uh, and my husband, too, and I learned so much, so thank you, Bob. Um, I've been to Korea, too, don't, don't get mad. <laughs> um, and also to CASE, Korean American Civic Empowerment, you'll hear from Mr. Kim very soon. Uh, Rabbi Faskowitz, thank you so much for your leadership for all of us, you're such an inspiration. And to my good friend Linda Lee from Korean Community Services, uh, you may have read about them, they're very famous in the newspaper these days, working with Assemblyman Ron Kim on helping our Korean American seniors. Uh, but anyway, thank you so much for all of you for being here and uh, let's hope for a productive conversation, thank you. Thank you. Uh, while I was standing at the door, uh, Consul General Sun came in, and my immediate reaction was, say hello. I did, uh, and I said, can I show you a Holocaust Center? And the answer was yes. And we came down, and what impressed me was how knowledgeable he was of what we have here in our center. And that's before we even got to the Korean exhibit. And we got to the Korean exhibit, and we talked about it. Um, it wasn't a shrug saying, yeah, well, what can you do about it? Uh, the response was, we're aware of this, and we are working on it, and we know the emotion. So I would like to introduce Consul General Sun. Uh, good evening. Uh, so. Uh, we Koreans uh, very often speak of uh, the Jewish community, which excels in every field. And the Koreans and uh, Jewish have uh, a lot of things in common. Of course, we have some differences. Uh, before just my uh, remarks, I'd like to uh, express my heartfelt uh, uh, gratitude to uh, uh, this uh, Holocaust uh, Center for uh, promoting uh, comfort women issue uh, to educate uh, the King's College students coming from uh, all over the world, about uh, 150 uh, uh, people, countries, and also to uh, uh, prevent uh, this tragic event from uh, reoccurring uh, in our gener next generation. Uh, Congressman uh, Grace Meng and President uh, Diane Cole of King's Borough Community College and Executive Director As Flug of uh, Kufferberg Holocaust Re uh, Center 
and distinguished uh, panelists, honored members of the Jewish and Korean American communities. It is my great pleasure to take part in this meaningful uh, intercultural dialogue between the Jewish and Korean American communities. I'd like to express my heartfelt appreciation to Representative Meng and uh, President uh, Diane Cole for hosting uh, this event. As you may be aware, uh, Jewish population consists of only 0.2% of the world's population. Yet, the percentage of Nobel Prize uh, winners of Jewish descent is a staggering 22%. Last year, six Jewish scholars received this coveted award, which was widely covered in Korean media. Such an amazing feat can be attributed to the high value Jewish families place on education. I, I was told of a Jewish family tradition of have, having uh, lively dialogues and discussions at dinner table to encourage their young to ask a question and develop critical thinking skills. There is a similar tradition in Korea. Uh, family members gather together to converse and share their, their day over dinner, though these talks frequently tend to be conducted in a rather top-down manner. And if there is one big difference between uh, two groups of parents, I would uh, have to say that uh, while Jewish parents ask their kids how many and what kind of questions they raised in, at school. Korean parents would ask, what was your test score? <laughs> this is a very big difference. A Jewish community is renowned for their creative and enduring spirit. Through persistence, resilience, and plain hard work, generations of Jewish communities laid the firm foundations for the next generation to succeed. In much the same way, many first-generation Korean Im immigrants supported their families through menial work when they first came here. They built groundwork for their next generation. Now, many of the second-generation Korean Americans have become successful. Today, Jewish Americans have been key contributing players in all aspects of our society. As for Korean Americans, they have recently made inroads in many areas like in fashion, medicine, law, and finance. A total of 73,000 Korean students are currently studying in the United States after China and India. This means Korea has the highest number of students in terms of per capita. Among these students, about 22,000 are studying in STEM fields, the areas of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Moreover, it is said that in famous design schools here in New York area, like Pratt, Parsons, FIT, and SBA, they cannot do without Korean students because Koreans make up a significant portion of their student uh, bodies. On Wall Street, over 2,000 Korean Americans are currently working there. As we progress from the old knowledge-based economy to a new creative-based economy, I earnestly hope our two communities can cooperate and support each other towards a new economic paradigm based on our commonalities as partners. Speaking of a deeper cooperation that would empower our communities, I am very much impressed by Jewish Americans' high civic participation. As a responsible citizen of a free democratic country, it is a duty to actively engage in social and political affairs, whether in local, state, or in federal level. I believe the Jewish community, in this sense, is a model community to many others, including Korean Americans. Ladies and gentlemen, it is meaningful that we are engaged in this dialogue at Kupferberg Holocaust Resource Center. 
Sadly and most tragically, our two peoples also share one common poignant experience, which is of the blatant and egregious violation of human rights committed against the Jewish and Korean people prior to and during the World War II. We need to work closer together to never permit such tragedy, tragedies to befall on our future generations. In this context, I'd like to underscore the fact that while the world moves toward integration in this age of globalization, Korea still remains the last vestige of the Cold War, in which this division poses a major threat to the region's peace and stability. Therefore, as a part of laying the foundation for unification, Korean President Park Geun-hye visited Germany last week to share their experiences of unification in a more profound and in-depth manner. There, she announced an initiative for peaceful unification on the Korean Peninsula, proposing expanding humanitarian aid and family reunions, sharing resources and infrastructure projects, and joint culture and education programs through the establishment of an inter-Korean exchange and cooperation office while urging North Korea to abandon its uh, nuclear weapons program. Unification will ma make the Korean Peninsula nuclear-free and a new market of growth engine, greatly contributing to peace and development in the Northeast Asia and the world. I'd like to ask Jewish leaders to join us on this journey to peaceful unification. In conclusion, there is a wise proverb that says, hold a true friend with both your hands. It means we must hold tightly onto those who believe are our true friends. So as we chart our mutual future, let us take a step forward, both hand in hand, to create a more harmonious and prosperous tomorrow together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Consul General Sun. Our panel tonight is a very unique panel. Let me introduce them briefly. Rabbi Bob Kaplan, uh, if there's any community in New York that is having a problem on relations with other people, if there's any community that is having a problem regarding medical issues and a host of others, they know Rabbi Bob Kaplan. I've known him. 20 years? 20 years, okay. 20 years, one of the most dynamic people in leadership in New York City. Next to him is someone I've only known for three years, but who has impressed me with his devotion to his particular causes of human rights, and that's Mr. Don Chang Kim, the president of the Korean American Civic Empowerment. I just met Rabbi Fauskowitz, who is the and I want to get this right, the rabbi of the Torah Center of Hillcrest and also the head of Yeshiva Madre Gasa. Now, I just met him this evening when he came and I said hello, and as is my duty, I was taking him through a tour of the Holocaust Center, and one of the things he raised as I was going through my presentation, he stopped me and he said, what about the moral aspects of what you're doing here? Major question. Unfortunately, I passed the test and I told them of what we are doing here. But I was impressed. That's not something that always comes up. And then finally, Linda Lee, social services. Everybody knows of Linda Lee in the Queens community. So having said that, I'd like to start off by doing one thing. I'd like each of the panelists to just say a word or two, not more than two minutes, about the issue we're discussing tonight. So, Rabbi? Sure. Um, first of all, thank you very much, Arthur, and I want to thank all the folks that helped put together tonight. It's incredibly important, particularly uh, Congresswoman Meng, it's incredibly important that we have, as representatives of the diverse populations of New York, consistently work with one another to look at the issues that we hold in common and the issues that we don't always hold in common. 
that we can build a common society together, that we can really look at the various things that are challenging us and the opportunities in front of us. Jewish Community Relations Council of New York, through the Center for Community Leadership, which I'm the founding director of, has been doing that for a number of years. Uh, hopefully I get to explain a little bit more about our work in just a few minutes. Giving a rabbi two minutes to speak is a relative impossibility, so I'm going to stick to it, and I'm going to pass it on to my colleague. Okay. Uh, Mr. Kim. I'm, gonna, uh, <clears throat> I'm too honored to be here, but I'm nervous too. <laughs> yes, um, and I'd like to thank you, uh, Congresswoman uh, Grace Meng, and uh, the President Diane Cole, and I'd like to thank you also, uh, my, my friend, uh, Dr. Fluke. So I have been here since 2011, so we have uh, a lot of good uh, work uh, for the human rights issues. So uh, I'm talking about, you know, uh, the panel discuss about the issues. Thank you. Rabbi Faskowitz. Actually, when I uh, was invited to come and join a panel discussion about the relationship between Jewish people and people of Korean descent, I thought to myself, this is really something that is very appropriate. You see, I'm here today because of the Asian community. That's the only reason I sit in front of you and I talk to you. You see, in 1941, my parents escaped from Poland. My mother made it through the um, Moscow, took the railway to Vladivostok, and ended up in Kobe, Japan. My father somehow made his way to Shanghai, which I think today is Beijing, and they hosted them until they were able to wend their way to the United States. And since I'm a child, I always remember my parents saying to me, when we emerged from that hell, the people that hosted us were the Asian people. And I express at the very beginning of my remarks my gratitude to this community, this wonderful, this wonderful, wonderful, great community, people who should be brothers, where we hold hand in hand. We are people who share so much struggle. We've all been under siege. We all know what suffering is. And truly, I think dialogues like this will make it very clear that they're not just commonalities that we have, but there's a deep, deep brotherhood that we share. And I hope that that will emerge through our efforts. Thank you, Rabbi. Ms. Lee. Thank you again to, oh, sorry. I don't know if this, okay. Thank you again to Congresswoman uh, Grace Ming for hosting this event and for all of you for coming tonight. Um, our communities are definitely very diverse. All of us have very different experiences. And even for myself, being a second generation Korean American, uh, I was born in upstate New York in Elmira. I don't know if anyone knows where that is, but it's somewhere between Binghamton and Ithaca. I was born in Rochester, <laughs> yeah. Rochester New York. Oh, Rochester, yes, right near there. <laughs> um, and then lived in Long Island for 20 years, where I attended, uh, I lived in the North Shore of Long Island and attended so many bat and bar mitzvahs that I pretty much uh, learned more Hebrew than I did Korean growing up. Um, so I sort of have the reverse, I guess, uh, experience. And it's it's been uh, a journey, and like everyone has been saying, um, you know, there's a lot to learn from each other, and we're very, very excited for the panel discussion tonight to talk about how we can continue that conversation. Thank you. Now, let me, instead of saying, I ask one question, ask each of you what you think, let me throw the questions out, and let's be a little freewheeling. So let me say this. You all represent different constituencies in your day-to-day -day work and your responsibility. So what are the key issues facing your community? Linda. Let's see, where do we begin? Uh, <laughs> well, it's interesting because I was trying to figure out where to, which issue to focus on. Um, I work at Korean Community Services, which has been around for 40 years in the community. So in terms of social service organizations, it's the oldest um, and largest in the metropolitan area. 
Um, and we face a lot of issues. I think one of the issues that I've been hearing more and more is the growing immigrant, senior, and aging population. I think along with that comes a whole host of other issues. Um, for example, I was just at the budget hearing last week talking about the need for culturally relevant homebound meals um, in our communities. And actually one of the folks from JASA who was there um, spoke on behalf of her community and, and about the need for more kosher meals for the aging population in, in Queens. Um, so that's one of the issues is that the, the senior housing issue, um, culturally sensitive and appropriate services. Um, and I think for us in the Asian community, it's also that much more augmented the issues because of the language barrier. Um, the Korean community is has one of the highest rates of LEP, which for those that are not familiar with that term is low English proficient. So there's many folks in our community that are very isolated and they don't know to call the social service office. They don't know to call Medicaid. They don't know where to call, so they call us. <laughs> Um, and unfortunately, what's happening is is that um, you know we try our best, of course, to connect these folks to the community, but we're only one organization, and I think there needs to be um, a lot more uh, resources put in place to um, support the staff and support um, programs like ESL that can sort of get them on their feet and help them uh, work independently. Um, so that, and also uh, mental health, is actually a growing concern. But again, it's it's. Uh, it's that much more augmented because of the fact that there are significant language barriers in our community. So hopefully we can work with others to um, form more resources and collaborate with each other. Okay, thank you. Rabbi Kaplan. Sure. The, the JCR, uh, JCRC of New York is sort of we set ourselves up with four pillars. Uh, it's new language that we're using nowadays to sort of focus in on what are some of the most important issues facing our community. Certainly Israel and, is, in, Israel and international issues are extremely important. Uh, apropos to what the Council General said, we're also living under nuclear threat. And the issue of whether it's North Korea or Iran and a nuclear threat from Iran is a very, very pertinent issue to the Jewish community of New York and how we relate to not only the threats from the outside, but also our international community. Half the Jews of the world live, approximately half the Jews of the world live in the United States and Half the Jews and approximately half the Jews live in Israel. How do we relate to Israel as, as a country of connectivity? Um, it isn't quite the same as a home country because not everyone comes there, but we do consider it on some level a home. Another leg or another <clears throat> pillar of what we do is the issue of government relations. How do we effectively navigate government? How do we deal with all the various different needs in the context, whether it's what Delinda talked about before, JASA or Jewish Board of Family and Children's Services, or the whole plethora of agencies that are dealing with social services, making sure that not only our community is getting the right services, but other communities are getting the right services as well. A third issue that we are dealing with is our own internal diversity and how that diversity is causing some consternation or problems within the context of our community, whether it be generational differences or it be religious differences or the connectivity to our community, how we're going to do that. And another big area of concern is the folks that are slowly slipping away from Jewish context, what we call just Jews, people who no longer have a firm connectivity to being Jewish. And how do we make sure that being Jewish is an essential part of every Jewish person in the context of New York City and certainly the United States. Then there's something that I do, and I've been doing this uh, close to 21 years now. It's how do we effectively work with the others in New York with this incredible diversity that was referred to before that the Congresswoman talked about, seeing diversity as a value, knowing what diversity means, how do we effectively plan together? How do we effectively build communities together? How do we effectively communicate with each other? How do we build leadership together? And, and how do we effectively rewrite the American dream together? As new folks come to the table, as new folks learn how to become part of America, how do we as a Jewish community that has been in America for close to 300 years, or someone like myself who's second also second generation American, how do we look at things? How do we operate? How do we connect? And how do we work with others who are looking to operate, build, and connect as well? Thank you, thank you. Mr. Kim.
Yes, of course, the immigra immigration uh, issues and um, co-naming East Sea, HL 1812, and Comfort Women Relate to Human Rights. As immigration reform is an issue for many immigrant uh, communities in the United States, it is an issue for the Korean Americans as well. Co-naming East Sea with the Sea of Japan is something that is very important to the Korean American community. During the Japanese occupy, occupation of Korea, our names and language were forcibly taken away. At the end of the World War II, our names were restored, but the body of, of water between Korea and Japan still remains as, a, as the Sea of Japan. Before the occupation, the same body of water was referred as the Sea of Korea or Sea of Joseon. It is not just us that would like the name, of, name to be restored. Other Asian nations won't be same same thing. We simply want the East, East Sea to be named together with the Sea of Japan. HR 1812 is, the, is a legislation allowing 15,000 professional work visas to South Korea nationals, which is co-sponsored by 49 Congress members including Congresswoman Grace Meng. This bill will compensate the U.S.-Korea free trade agreement, create many jobs in, in the U.S., especially in the Korean-American community, and benefit the Korean-American community. Comfort woman issue. As you already know, comfort woman is a Euphemi euphemism for the sexual slavery by Japanese armed forces before and during World War II. There are survivors testifying what they suffered at, at the comfort station from Japanese soldiers and documents providing Japanese government's involvement. However, Japan is continuing to deny it. We believe Japan should unequivocally accept their responsibility and the past war crimes and teach it to their next generations. Okay, thank you. And Rabbi, your community, what problems do you see? Besides some of the um, <clears throat> issues that we're familiar with, the global issues, I talk about directly my Orthodox community in Hillcrest, and these are issues that I think we all share. We're very, very concerned with security. Being able to walk out of our house being able to sleep at night and not to fear break-ins, et cetera, et cetera. All of you share this with me. It's the safety, the day-to-day, -day, and um, that I hear all the time. Housing is an issue, an issue that many, many of our constituents are very concerned about because it just gets more difficult and more difficult as this lazy economy moves on and seems to squeeze the little bit that we have even a little more a little tighter, it becomes difficult day in and day out. And then there's the issue of poverty. How do you alleviate the situation for those people that never understood what poverty is? They, they, the word wasn't real. And today, people have been working their whole lives, dedicated their lives, both to private and public service as humiliating as it is, are coming forth and telling us that they're poverty-stricken and we are not equipped to deal with this situation. I'm, as you said, a spiritual leader. All I can offer is a blessing. That doesn't put food on the table. I can offer encouragement, but that doesn't make the children any happier when they don't have clothes. And all I can say is that we need desperately to consolidate with other people in the community. That means not the Jewish community, because the Jewish community will not solve the problem. We will solve the problem if we can join together with the Korean community, and we can join together with others who understand and share the same problems. Then, in solidarity, we become powerful. In solidarity, our voices then will be heard and I hope it will make a difference. 
I, I think that's what this is about, that we can become one, as I said before, and that's when the impact will really make that difference to change the lives of the people who are hurting amongst us. Okay, thank you, Rabbi. <clears throat> I, I think your, your comment was leading into my next question. All of us, have, all of the people at our table, our panel, has come forward and presented issues facing their communities. Some of these have been personal issues, some of them have been very local issues, and some have moved on to the international scale. So at this point, let me put this on the table. We hear as people of Jewish background, we hear people of Asian, Korean background. What can we come together on? What can we come together on? to move forward in any one of the areas that we've mentioned today. Anyway, Bob? So about 20 years ago, we were asked to help build relationships between different groups throughout New York, and Arthur has done, and the Kufferberg Center has done an amazing job here in Queens. And what we began to do, and with folks like uh, Dr. Kiho Kim, and with folks from the, the YWCA over on Parsons Boulevard, looking at the issue of health care and how we could build better health care. So we helped to form something in 1994 called the Northern Queens Health Coalition. And the Northern Queens Health Coalition was around to 2007, looking at issues like cultural competency, when before anyone knew that, that terminology, how the medical system, and I was very encouraged tonight when I heard that the uh, New York Hospital Queens Medical Center now has an Asian center because it just wasn't on the map. But to echo the rabbi is that how do we effectively blend our needs together? And sometimes those needs are not going to fit exactly together, but blend them together to raise up an entire situation. Whether it's Meals on Wheels, and then Linda and I have talked about this, we're looking to help incubate a new coalition in Queens on the issue of immigrant aging, because it's a radically important issue where all immigrants can come together. Because uh, to be very concrete, the cost of a kosher meals on wheel, or the cost of a, a, a Korean uh, meals on wheels, or the oh, halal meal, uh, meal on wheel, mm -hmm. is about $2 more than you're getting reimbur reimbursed for. Mm -hmm. That means that you have to go to government, and you have to say, you got to take a new look at this. Mm -hmm. Because it, 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 Linda's absolutely right. The populations are growing, not only in the Korean community, but in the Chinese community, the South Asian community, every community, and in the Jewish community. We have needs. We have as, as the rabbi pointed out, older folks that are now living on the edge where they never lived on the edge before, but only by sitting down at the same table, looking at the same issues together, understanding that we have deep areas of commonality and strength, can we begin to solve some of these problems through some very, very thoughtful new ways, from thinking outside the box, but allowing everyone to see that the issues before us are common. And only by building communities together we're going to be able to do this. So whether it is international issues and dealing with a nuclear North Korea or a nuclear Iran, whether it's local issues like Meals on Wheels, whether it's, it's providing culturally competent health care in the context of a community or public safety in the context of the community, it's only going to happen when we sit together, think together, work together, and plan together. Okay, thank you. Uh, anyone else like to take it? Rabbi. <laughs> um, just to echo what uh, Rabbi Kaplan was saying, I totally agree with him. And actually, it's funny because we just had a conversation together maybe a month ago about the work that was done in the past uh, with the Northern Queens Coalition and how we wanted to start something like that again. Because um, unfortunately, it ended in 2007, right? And and um, I think. I think one of the strengths of the Jewish community that we can learn from is the fact that you guys have really created such an amazing civic voice. Uh, your communities have come together, you've advocated um, on behalf of your communities for resources, and I think that's something that we can definitely learn from your community on and hopefully work together with you and partner on. Because um, when it comes to all the poverty issues, and a lot of, a lot of I think, folks in our communities have this model minority myth where, you know, Asians are okay, they're not poor, they go to Harvard, and they excel in math, which was so not me, but um, <laughs> I did, definitely didn't excel in math. But, um, 
you know, I think people, there's, there's kind of like this stereotype and perception, which we're finding out after you peel off the layers is actually not true. There are a lot of needs in our community. There are poverty issues, especially among the seniors. Unfortunately, people are living longer, uh, which is the reality. And um, so we have to learn how to address those issues and how to, um, I think like the rabbi was saying, not reinvent the wheel, but um, collaborate with each other and to really help each other out as a community. And... Um, yeah, I think the advocacy issue is huge. I mean, one one prime example is um, I know that at the federal level, um, the funding is shifting. That's another issue as well, is that a lot of the dollars are going towards Department of Health and other city agencies, but they're not really funneling towards the community organizations as much anymore. And I think that shifting landscape in terms of the resources is definitely going to affect how we can provide these services and continue them. So I think maybe that's something even, I know it's kind of specific, but maybe that's even something we could work on potentially in the future. You see, I think, uh, I hope nobody will be insulted, I think it's a futile endeavor as we present it right now and I'll tell you what I mean unless there's one answer and it goes this way we're a very insular community especially Orthodox Jews we we're really in Koreans same thing they're an ins it's a, and so are so many of the other ethnic groups and when I say we I'm an old man it's the older people it's, it's not going to happen here. I think Dr. Kohls mentioned it before when you gave me graciously that beautiful uh, showing of the exhibit and I went into the back room where you explained how the students get together and all exposed to the same message that these changes have to be made and what are the changes that we feel each other's pain and we recognize each other's challenges and we appreciate each other's differences. It's the youth. It's the young people. It's the college here. It's everywhere else. You see, we're preaching to the choir. We know the issues. We, we all know it hurts. But it's very hard to create people who are set in their ways to to really change, that, that is almost reinventing the wheel. It's not that you can't find something that is common and appreciation. And we can party together, that we can do. Mm -hmm. but, but we want to change the world. You see, we don't want to join party. What we're talking about is changing the world. We won't change the world. The young people will change the world. And I think that what you described to me before, the dialogue that goes on here between the Jewish students and the Asian students and European students and that diversity that you described and in all the colleges and all the universities all over. If we can get them working together and if we can get them to become the voices who will send the messages that we know. We can articulate them but they have to enunciate them. And if we can do that, that will have impact. See, that will change everything. But I think there has to be a concerted if you want to, in other words, not the, pro the problems we spoke about. The answer to the problem is the young people. We've got to figure out how to get young people to begin to appreciate each other. How to let them play together. Let them enjoy together. Let them talk to each other. Let them learn what each other is all about. Let them begin to love each other. We'll have impact. That will make a, it'll make a beautiful difference. Mr. Kim? I think uh, tonight's occasion is the first step. It is a good example. Um, and we have a, a, a good relationship with the uh, Kofferberg Holocaust Center, uh, especially uh, Dr. Flu. Uh, I'm going to introduce about uh, these examples. Uh, during, during World War II, both of our communities suffered great losses and were victims of war crimes in different reasons. We find this to be very important because, because crimes were committed against us around the same time. For the past few years, our communities have engaged in civic activism together. One particular example that I'd like to mention is the partnership between Korean American Civic Empowerment case and the Kafferberg Holocaust Center. This program was created 
to educate students about war crimes and the importance of protecting human rights. The two organizations have been working since 2011 to increase awareness of Japan's war crimes to prevent them from happening in the future and to urge Japan to formally acknowledge its crimes. The East Asia, Asian Historic Justice Internship, a program created for college students, is currently at its third session. The tangible goal is to prevent such blatant abuses of human rights from ever happening again through educational programs such as us. Ours, we must work together to share, to share one of America's values, human rights, and to make the United States our shared nation greater. Thank you, Rob. Actually, I want to build upon something that Linda and, and Rabbi Faskowitz said, and likewise is the youth issue. Um, I'm a big proponent of something which I call intergenerational dialogue. I think it's radically important that diversity doesn't just mean Koreans and Jews or blacks and whites, it's also generational differences. Mm -hmm. And we need to find a, an effective way that generations are talking to each other and working with each other, both internally in our own communities and between, between other communities as well. I know that in our Center for uh, Community Leadership, we have a program called Youth Bridge, where we bring together about 55 best and brightest teens, scary young people because they're just so damn smart. Um, the most impressive thing they can do is do a Rubik's Cube in about 55 seconds, which is really a scary thing. But, you know, getting them to know how to solve problems together. We're here in Queens. I know J.D. Kim is part of something called uh, we, are, we Are the One Queens, where about 25 leaders representing the full diversity of Queens get together, young leaders, and they learn methodologies and skills. You're right about learning methodologies and skills so that they can begin to learn how to solve problems together. The kinds of stuff we're up against is long haul. And we have to make those long haul investments, whether it's here at the college, and it's an important place, you know, higher education is a radically important part of the piece, but we also have to make sure that generations are talking to each other, planning with each other, so diversity in all of its format can be brought to bear to look at some of the issues and create some of the answers. Let, let me pull this all together by just telling you briefly of something that takes place usually three or four times a week right outside this entrance to your left. Uh, about 3.30, 4 o'clock happened today and it'll probably happen Thursday or Friday. A woman appears. The woman is, I guess the best word can say, is destitute. You can see by the clothing she's wearing, they are soiled, they are torn, and she's carrying a sack. And it's usually a black plastic sack that we use for lawn or for garbage. And in one hand, she's carrying the sack, and in the other hand, she is carrying a pair of tongs, the type of tongs that we use for cooking, especially in barbecuing, if you don't want to pick up something hot. And I see her coming up this hill where the bus stop is, and she comes to the garbage pail right outside it, and with the tongs, she goes in there, digs in, and looks for discarded soda bottles, because a discarded soda bottle is a nickel. Okay. And I notice more and more as this happens, Students who are walking down the hill will see her and give her a bottle of soda they maybe have been drinking or reach in and give it so. Now you mentioned intergenerational. Is the issue that we have to look at one generation who is struggling very, very hard to make it, not doing very well in that struggle, and say, okay, but it's the next generation that has to go on to do it. Um, I'm first generation American. Um, we learned we had a struggle. We never discussed whether we were gonna go to college or not. It was understood. And probably the worst thing we could do was come home with anything but an A on our report card in conduct. Anything else was not acceptable. But is it 
a generational process where people come to that point and say, one generation has to really do the struggle so the next generation is able to succeed. As, as you've talked about intergenerational, and Rabbi, you talked about it. What, what is, it? is it? Do we have to come to this point in this get together and to tie it up and say, we should take all our efforts and designate them towards creating an intergenerational program. Is that the one most important thing that we have to come out? I know that it's not really the most important thing, but where would that rate if we had to do that? Linda, you want to come, Rabbi? Anybody? Yeah, well, I, again, I think it comes to the same point. I don't think that the older generations can consolidate as one and become that cohesive group. I think they could learn to understand each other and to respect each other. I grew up in uh, Canarsie, Canarsie neighborhood. You know, my, the older generation, you had the Jewish and Italian, there was a kind of a tenuous relationship. Me, I played ball with all my Italian friends. My Italian friends were all the Jewish friends. We, 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 we became close. But it was very difficult for the earlier generation because they were older and it's almost hard to teach them new technique and to, to, to you know, there's a distrust and there's always, there's a certain skepticism, there's fear, it's different. And, and when people are older, it's very hard to make, you can't expect them to make those kind of adjustments. But young people, they make those adjustments. So I, could, I do believe that you take this younger, and I think it's actually paramount. It's paramount if this is a dream or it's a reality. If this is a reality, I have to, as an older person, defer to the youth, because it's going to be the youth that is going to make these communities really be one power, one, they're going to be solidarity, they're going to be one voice, they're going to be one group. So it's not just, you know, another element in inter, uh, um, uh, I guess you might say generational uh, uh, discipline, I think it's, it's, it's really key to, to moving forward in the future. Okay, with that, I'm going to thank the members of the panel for tonight. Now, I want you to know, this is only the first time. Okay, so keep your date books open, okay? Now what I'd like to do, please don't get up, because you saw the Korean cultural presentation. I still feel it from those drums that were going. We now have an Israeli Institute dance group coming. Gentlemen? They're coming out.
that, that was the Israel Dance Institute. We thank you so much. We thank those of you here who are coming. Please join us for a collation in our gallery. And if we have any questions, our speakers will be here, as will I. Thank you for coming.